Hello, little people. I'm Medina Alvarez. Today on Arts History of the Interesting Bits, the colony of New Australia. We start our tale in 1891, when Australia was filled with both sheep and the nice man who shared them. Sh shared them. Sh shared them. Sh shared them. The shearers worked in horrible conditions, and soon unions were organized to give them better conditions. This wasn't greatly liked, it had to be said, by the farmers who owned the actual sheep, and they started their own group to stop the unions strong-handing them. It led to a tense standoff. The shearers wanted more money to share the sheep. The farmers wanted not to pay them more money to share the sheep. The sheep themselves were probably indifferent, though no one would have bothered to ask them anyway. When one farmer tried to get his shearers to work for less money, they decided to strike. And they told their mates, and they decided to strike too. Soon everyone was striking, and in an act of defiance, the shearers sent a list of demands. These noble demands were, no more trying to underpay the workers, protection against exploitation, the promise of fair agreements going forward, and no Chinese workers. What? That was a thing? Really? It kind of sounds a bit racist. Well, it was a bit racist. Okay, there were three noble girls and one scumbaggy one. Anyway, the strike ended when the police decided to beat the Jiminy out of the shearers, who by this time were pretty half-starved anyway. Even as the shearers were all like, Don't hit me in the face! Not my beautiful face! Their plight was being taken up by others. One of the others in this case was this man. This is William Lane, an English dude who went to America and then came here. He was a journalist, a communist, and an anarchist. He saw the battered, slightly racist shearers and thought there must be a better way. Others did too, and they ended up forming the Australian Labour Party. William Lane, though, took another direction. He decided instead of running for Parliament, to start a communist utopia instead. Because communist utopias always work out, don't they? So, William Lane looked around for somewhere to host his socialist republic. Happily, a small South American nation, Paraguay, was there to help. See, while the Queensland shearers were being beaten up by policemen in shiny uniforms, Paraguay was being beaten up by Argentina, Brazil, and, and Uruguay. D don't forget Uruguay. See, they got into this war with Brazil, and, and Brazil decided to bring in some friends, including the aforementioned Uruguay. After four years of conventional and guerrilla warfare, up to 70% of the male population of Paraguay was gone. And so the Paraguayan government was after menfolk, and William Lane could provide it to them. So it happened, the 238 bronze dozies, mostly men, gave up everything they had and boarded a ship in Sydney in 1893. Side note, Dame Mary Gilmore was part of this expedition. She appears on our $10 note, th thus making a mockery of the whole communism thing. Anyway, they set sail to their new home, and they called it New Australia, and it was glorious. Well, it was glorious except for one thing. William Lane, this chap who founded it, didn't like bows. It turned out he was a journalist, a communist, an anarchist, and a teetotaler. And his followers, it's safe to say, weren't. They liked the bows. Quite a lot. So the bows was out, which the settlers were not a fan of. Another thing that was out was women. While most of the settlers liked the idea of hanging around the ladies of Paraguay, you know, giving them flowers, taking them for strolls, and... Well, we're not doing that? Oh, okay. But William Lane would not allow it. Not because of some religious thing, not even because he was concerned for the local women. No, William Lane was a xenophobe. One of his main goals was to preserve the Australian bloodline. It turns out William Lane was a journalist, a communist, an anarchist, a teetotaler, and a scumbag racist. Just like the Queensland shearers before him, he mixed ideals about social equality with rampant bigotry. And in addition, he proved once again that the worst teetotalers are racist, and the worst racists are teetotalers. In fact, if you want my advice, don't hang around with teetotalers at all. They'll just pretend to be your friends, and then rat you out to the fuzz. <sighs> anyway, to make matters worse, Lane was also pretty bad at managing the colony. 
The land, it turned out, was less than utopic. Utopic? Utopic. And more of a jungle. And land didn't really inspire folk. Pretty soon, he was largely forced to split the colony. He and his friends moved to a new settlement called Cosme, while the remaining drunky Aussies stayed in New Australia, renamed it to New London, and got to know the local ladies, which would have been a relief to the Paraguayan government, given that that was the reason for bringing them out there in the first place. In the end, New Australia kind of just fell apart. Most settlers went back to Australia eventually, though some stayed. The Paraguayan government ended up dividing the land amongst the colonists who decided to stay, and everyone forgot about that whole pesky communism stuff. And it was largely forgotten. Except that right now in Paraguay itself, you can still find a few small groups of people who can trace their ancestry direct backly to those wide brown Nazis. This has been Oz History, The Interesting Bits. I'm Medina Alvarez. Another story next week, or until the judge says I can stop.